Hello there and welcome to The Attic for another live stream interview. Today I am absolutely thrilled to welcome to the channel Daniel Torridon, uh, originally from the UK but now living, uh, it seems, in Australia. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. Good morning. Thank you for uh, having me on the show, Lloyd. Yeah, we were just saying it, it's early, early in the morning for you and fairly late in the evening for me. But we've, we've, mm. the, you know, the stars have aligned and <laughs> we, we've managed to uh, come together uh, because um, I've been, you know, kind of noticing uh, your, shall we say, forays into the world of um, post cult and, and ex Jehovah's Witness activism. And uh, I, th I think you bring um, a refreshingly cerebral approach uh, to those subjects. So, um, you. you know, how are you? How have you found that? Because I, I know to some extent you. I was I was reading one of your more recent uh, blog articles where you were saying you were kind of stepping back a bit from from mm. ex Jehovah's Witness activism. Uh, you know, talk us through uh, before we get into your story. Talk us through um, you know what activism has been like for you. Um, I've, I've never really considered myself particularly as an activist, mm. uh, certainly never for the, the long, you know, the long haul. Mm. Um, I, I always thought there would sort of be an, an end to, uh, the JW side of things, um, or at least a, a sort of point where I'd reach and I wouldn't be doing so much content on that. Mm. Um, initially I think it was, uh, I had something I had to, had to, speak up about i think that was mm. it i've been silenced for so long um as as a witness you know you just got to keep your mouth shut haven't you mm. or lose everything uh and when i found myself in a position where i was able to speak and i didn't didn't have anything else to lose um i felt i had to tell my story and i felt i had to speak up about where the organization was um false effectively yeah. but I always kind of had the idea that I would reach a point where I had said pretty much everything that I needed to say and then I would kind of move forward and hopefully leave the whole JW thing behind I mean I, I know I know it's a part of our our past isn't it and there, there's mm. always going to be occasions where we we probably have to say something or get involved with something but um that's what I was looking forward to, sort of move moving beyond it, really, I think. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I, I, and I relate to so much that you've said. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like the, I mean, I, I call pretty much anything that's dealing with bringing, re that's bringing resources to people as activism. Um, but I mm -hmm. guess what you're saying is that the, the work that you've done, uh, had a therapeutic, um, yes. a, a, a very, very large therapeutic component. Mm. Yeah, very, very, very much so. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I don't know, some, somehow, I don't know whether it's a self-esteem thing or not, but somehow I look at, I look at other activists that are at, at work within the, the XJW community. And I've never really, I always look at them and think like they're quite professional at this. Whereas I, I'm just a, <laughs> just a guy sort of, saying how I, how I feel and what have you. I've never really sort of felt like a professional activist in... There's not really been much of a plan, I think, is what I'm no. saying. Well, that's <laughs> the best way of doing it. You know, just yeah. say, your, say your truth and yeah. either it resonates with people or it doesn't. Mm. You know, I, I feel like sometimes there's almost like a tangible frustration from some people when what they have to say doesn't get quite the traction that they anticipated mm. um but but you know with me personally uh i i just started talking and i started writing yeah. blog articles and started making videos and you, you just kind of put it out into the ether and mm. uh let it have its own life and if, if and hope that it resonates with people but you know don't have too many expectations and yeah i think when you approach it that way you're always going to be um, more relaxed and uh, more relatable uh, because mm. YouTube uh, in particular, I think um, the most successful YouTubers are the ones who are authentic 
uh, mm. because people don't watch YouTube for um, stuff that seems fake. Um, they, they watch it because it's different from the television and the, they can expect the unexpected. Yes. So, yeah. Fantastic. So let's kind of delve into your story a little bit because I know you've been involved, uh, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, you've been involved in uh, Jehovah's Witnesses for 50 years. Mm. Uh, looking yeah. good for that amount of involvement, no, by was, the way. I was, I was 54 uh, the other day. <laughs> wow. Okay, I, I'll have a bit of your DNA, please. Oh, okay. um, so 50 years in, and mm. um, you were a ministerial servant and a pioneer. And for the last 20 years, you were partaking of the memorial emblems. So there's a lot to unpack oh, well, there. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was a, a regular pioneer most of my life. Uh, right. Ministerial servant, elder, so-called anointed. Mm. Um, third generation born in. So. Mm. I go back quite a quite a way. Wow. And how, how did you first, how did Jehovah's Witnesses first make landfall in your life? Well, so I was born in, um, I mean, my earliest memories, in fact, my, my very first memory was being at an assembly when I was about two years, uh, 18 months old, something like that. Um so like really really on i remember going to meetings kind of at, at two three years old and then right from as early as i can kind of really remember four i think i was i was a publisher um going out on the doors selling the uh, watchtower and um, awake magazines because back then you used to sell them for a price yeah yeah i can't remember what it was about back two in the day or something back in the day <laughs> sounding old now um yeah, so sort of from about four years old, I was like giving talks on the platform and that sort of thing. My my dad uh, particularly trained me to be a really good Jehovah's Witness from an early age, um, and then I got to I got to about eleven uh, ish, and I had a, a complete breakdown um, at school due to being uh, abused at school, which was not very nice. Um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, and I had a lot of uh, mental health issues quite early on, uh, but I got over that, and then I got to 16 and uh, got baptised because it was. Uh, I, I got the impression it was expected of me if I didn't get well, 16 baptized. is a bit late, isn't it? It I mean, is considering a bit late. Yeah. you yeah. can get baptised as young as six. You've kind of given well, yourself my, a good ten years there. My sister was getting baptised. You see, she was only mm. 14, and uh, it made me think, oh, crumbs, you know, my sister's getting baptised and I'm not. Mm. Um, and then after a chat with my mum, my mum basically said, well, you know, you can uh, you can be a uh, Jehovah's Witness and get into paradise or or you can not and be on Satan's side and die at Armageddon. And I was like, mm, OK, so that's so. A brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll do that then. <laughs> so I got yeah. back to 16, went straight into the pioneer ministry. And then I, I pretty much pioneered for most of my life, even uh, even after I had kids. So. And that is, um, you know, without wanting to get into too much detail, that that's uh, a massive encumberment on your kind of success in terms of your career and and your success oh, yeah. financially, isn't it? Because you, you know you're you're limited to you know part time work, um, and you know most part time work is quite low paying, uh, or or there's mm. very little kind of opportunity for career development um yeah so i mean I, I was quite lucky in a way because i got into um i got into web development oh which is quite a good paying job like by the hour it's quite a good mm. paying job so i could i could kind of earn an average wage uh in two days which was good fantastic um, but if if i'd have not pioneered and i'd have just done web development i'd be a very rich man now <laughs> yeah and i'm not well it's well yeah i mean this is what i mean there's mm. there's almost there's it's like there's a dollar amount you know somewhere um yeah. that we're all kind of owed because yeah, we yeah. were working for free i mean you will have started pioneering when it was 90 hours yep uh then it goes down to 70 and of course now it's 50 yeah um, oh, it's easy these days yeah <laughs> tell you what nowadays they don't know they're born do they um 
But wow, okay, so you were involved as a, a ministerial servant or elder, and this will have given you a source of access to a, a little bit the a little bit of the inner workings of of oh. the congregation. Um, can you ref, you know re- call to mind any examples of of when you were you know working with other people on that level of where it, it seemed kind of obvious almost that this this is a human organization? Yeah, I think almost immediately, although I kind of suppressed it somewhat, which is where the cognitive dissonance comes in, isn't it? I think almost mm. immediately, one of the very first things that happened when I was appointed as as an elder was uh, we got a letter from Bethel saying that we needed to destroy um, any records that we had, like minutes of meetings, that kind of thing. Um particularly with respect to anything that was to do with uh, child abuse cases. So they didn't want any of that on on file in the uh, elders' minutes, because back then they used to, when you had an elders' meeting, there'd, there'd be one of the elders sat there with a book, literally yeah. writing everything down that was said, you mm. know. And we were told, you know, you've got to get rid of all of that. And then shortly after that, we had a circuit overseer's visit and they they were talking about the subject of child abuse. This is quite early on when it first started to become a problem. If you remember the uh, do you remember the panorama? Yeah, I do v- vividly. Program. Yeah, mm. Mm. it was around about that time. That would and that was, was two thousand and two. That was two thousand two. This will have yeah. been this would have been a bit before that. This was about uh, ninety nine two thousand. We got a circuit overseer's visit, basically saying to keep everything in the house. Um, the, the instructions were to report to Bethel, but try not to let it get out because it looks bad. That was effectively, and you, you start seeing things like that as a young, youngish elder. And you start thinking, Hmm, that seems a, seems a bit off. But mm. the problem is because you've been trained to believe, uh, that they know best and you're just, you know, a cog in the machine you don't speak up, or at least I didn't at the time. It just sort of registers in here, and you feel uneasy, but you don't do anything about it. Mm. That's, uh, I think that's the, the early sort of time. And then I got, not long after that, I got asked to go and uh, serve in a congregation that was having some problems. And being a young elder, this, this, is, this is why in the Second World when War... When you that, say having some problems... Having some I've problems. got to know what kind of problems these were. Well, the uh, they had eight elders in this congregation, and four of them didn't like the other four, uh, and they wanted them removed. So the other four resigned all on the same evening, and then the congregation basically split down the middle. It was like the, this side of the congregation was supporters of these four, and this side was supporters of these four, and they were just like to- it was like total anarchy in this congregation. And me being just a, a relatively young elder at the time, you get asked to go and serve. And it, this is the reason why in the Second World War they used to make uh, the young people, the uh, Spitfire pilots and what have you, you've, you've got no sense of fear, have you? No. If, if, if I'd been asked sort of five or six years later, would you go and serve in a congregation that's got those level of problems on your own, I'd have turned around and said no. <laughs> yeah. As a young man, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, let's let's go for it." And I went into mm-hmm. that congregation, and within, oh, what was it? I went in in two thousand. I was disfellowshipped in two thousand and six. So, I lasted. Well, that's I lasted, another story. So, I lasted six years before I drew the attention of. <laughs> people. Okay. So, well, but did that? Because um, it's interesting that you've described, kind of. Uh, infighting in, in a, in a oh, congregation and terribly yeah you, you know you, you do hear of this happening in fact you know I, I have first-hand experience of um friction shall we say um mm. on an elder body um and you know you'd hear stories where where it was affecting like an entire congregation um mm. how and, and you say that four elders stood down did did that resolve the issue or or, or did the kind of resentment kind of linger on a little bit? No, the, resen- the resentment was still there. Because mm. then what they did, the four that stepped down, were then going around the congregation sort of 
trying to undermine the other four and mm. make them look bad. And um, it, it was one of those situations where everybody was accusing everybody else of slander. Mm. You know, um, mm. and though it was a, it was a, it was not a nice situation. And I, in the end, because I was kind of in the middle of it all, I actually said to the circuit overseer, I think the best thing to do would be to remove the other four and just start with a clean slate. Even mm. remove me if you have to. Oh, wow. Just start okay. With a complete clean slate and send in sort of five or six elders that are completely unbiased. They've never mm. had any experience of the congregation, you know. Mm. Um, but as it happens, that, that didn't happen. Uh, the CO arrived and uh, just deleted the other four. And it left me and another brother that had been sent in from Bethel. So that at one point, there was just the two of us together. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I, How many publishers? Uh, about 120. Oh, good grief. Quite a few, yeah. We were like doubling up on jobs. Yeah. I was doing the uh, secretary and field overseer and uh, what's the other one? School for a little while. Yeah. Yeah, Good and then we got, we got a few others sent in from Bethel, um, mm. and that was that was all right for a bit. Actually, it settled down a bit. But um, as time went on, I found out that one of the guys that Bethel had sent in was actually best mates with four of the original elders. Oh, and he was pushing to have them re, re conflict uh, of reinst interests. Conflict of interests, yeah. And when I noticed this, I was like, right, okay, you're not very very um, impartial. Mm. And I started noticing he was a bit of a bully. Mm. He, he was the uh, what they used to call the presiding overseer. And yeah. he used to get his way a lot. And uh, I started saying no to him after a while. I was like, mm, no, I'm not doing that. Mm. And uh, it was him that eventually was uh, instrumental in getting me disfellowshipped as an apostate. So, Wow. Okay. Mm. So I wasn't playing ball, you see. I wasn't. I wasn't doing everything. Yeah, but it. It, it's one thing to be kind of uncooperative mm. with, uh, like, a fellow elder. Uh, you know, I I've been in that situation where you are because I was an elder for twelve months, and um, the presiding overseer. I think they switched from calling it the presiding overseer mm. to the coordinator of the body of elders during that year that I was serving. And he was a bully. He, you know, he, yes, he, this, this guy he, was, yeah. he, he just, it, if there was an opportunity to make people feel small, if there was an opportunity to quote unquote count counsel someone on, on the slightest of issues, he'd be doing it. And, yeah. you know, a, a, an example I mentioned in my book is um, one meeting um, one of the servants was up on the platform giving a talk and his wife ran out of the hall crying. And, you know, I, I did some investigations and found out that it was because um, her husband, who was stood on the platform, had recently been counselled um, for having a Range Rover. He, he he had he had a Range Rover or or, or some some kind of fancy four by four. You know, it it was a a nice car, and and uh, the presiding overseer had said it was too flashy, basically too flash, and, and it yeah. caused his his wife to once she saw him on the platform to to run out crying, and it was that sort of thing was going on, and the, yeah. The, uh congregation we that i was in it was so stressful the circuit overseer actually um broke down in tears on the platform got down and left it was his last visit he never said goodbye to anyone <laughs> he just, just burst into tears at the end and walked off <laughs> that's actually quite funny yeah. i'm thinking of the, there's a scene in the it crowd where where um someone just gets up from a meeting and just jumps through the window. Um, that's it. Yeah, it was exactly it's like, like that. I'm out of here sort of thing. That's it, yeah. um, okay. So <laughs> you, you, you run into this uh, kind of toxic personality who's quite well embedded in, in the yeah. uh, congregation. And, it, you know, it's one thing to um, kind of resist that and, and to, you know, not play ball, but to actually be 
charged with apostasy is pretty serious. Mm. So, you know, what, you know, was this looking back with the benefit of hindsight, you know, was this justified or was he, was he just kind of clutching at straws? I don't think it was justified at the time. Mm. Um, I would say at later date, yes, I have become an apostate. Uh, but at the time, no, I don't. don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I was, I was talking about this the other day, actually, to Mariella. It's like, it's, I think sometimes the organisation actually makes apostates, don't they? Mm. You know, I, I was so I was at a point where I was questioning um, whether or not I should be partaking of the memorial emblems after having done a lot of Bible reading, and I could see discrepancies between what the Bible teaches and what the Watchtower was was teaching. And I came to the conclusion that if you're a Christian, if that if that's what you profess to be, then you are, by definition, anointed, because that's what Christ means. Which uh, was the whole thing with Ray Franz. The whole it? thing with Ray Franz, yeah. yeah. I actually read Ray Franz's uh, book after, not before, but after I was uh, disfellowshipped. But I, I, I started... A, a lot of heavy Bible reading around that time. This was about 2004. Um, and I started to look in, I never read any apostate literature or looked at anything online at all. Uh, I just read the society's publications going back, you know, right back to like the 1800s. So I was reading like the studies in the scriptures and all those sort of books. And it became really apparent to me that the 1914 uh, idea had no basis in reality at all mm, mm. um and i i always had a really good open dialogue with my dad and going back even as a child we used to sit there like hammering out all these sort of ideas you know this scripture says this but this scripture says that it looks like a contradiction how do we resolve it you know and the watchtower said this but that doesn't make sense you know it was all very open back back in those days and I discussed the things that I was learning with my dad. So I said, you know, I think I might have found some evidence for 1914 not being correct. And I think this scripture means that, you know, all anointed one, uh, all Christians should be partaking of the emblems, these sort of things. Yeah. And it was around the same time as that presiding overseer, this, this bully. It was around that time that I was starting to stand up to that, that bully. Mm saying no to him you know he'd be asking me to do things uh, or telling me to do things and i'd say no you know mm. um i'm not doing that uh and I, I think what happened is he went to see my dad and did a little bit of you know the old witch hunt right and well, asked, asked my dad he needed some know, dirt on you and, mm. and your dad provided it un yeah. un probably unknowingly yeah yeah unknowingly i think at the time mm. uh, i remember sitting in the car with my uh now ex-wife at the time and i said to her i just got a really bad feeling that this guy is going to try and you know screw me over here mm. and he did he went to my dad he, he basically said to him you know as, as uh, daniel ever said anything to you that's not in line with scripture and my dad was like oh yeah he said this <laughs> he said that <laughs> and then the next thing i know i was invited to uh, a judicial hearing and the charge was apostasy and it wow. started off, it started off because I'd said to my dad that there were, there were a few things in the old Daniel's prophecy book. Do you remember that one? Was Are a we few... talking the 1999 um I think so, book. yeah. 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 I remember saying to my dad, I think there's a few things in there that don't make sense. I don't, I don't oh, that was, that was the beginning, the beginning of my tentative attempts at waking up. Yeah, definitely. Mm. There was definitely some stuff in there that didn't make any sense. And the, mm. the judicial hearing started off by the chairman holding up a... Uh, a Daniel's book, and he said, right, tell me now, do you believe every single thing that's written in this book? <laughs> I mean, how do you answer that? I was like, uh, and then he jumped straight in. Any normal brother would have said yes. <laughs> I was like, damned from the outset, you know? Wow. And that went, on for, that went on for seven hours, that hearing, and I had a complete breakdown again. So that was my second mental breakdown. Sorry, the hearing went on for seven hours. Yeah. I mean, was yeah. it, were there any tea or coffee breaks? Were there any refreshments? I mean, I that's... think there might have been one tea break. <laughs> it was ridiculous. really, 
Seven hours is seven hours. It was really bad. Yeah, and I I reached a point where I was completely broken mentally, Mm. and I I can actually I can actually remember one point where it felt like the entire room was dark, and there was like a spotlight on me, and I and it was just I couldn't. My brain was like out of it. I couldn't even see the people in the room anymore. Um. I don't know what was happening to my brain at the time, but it, it was basically they were just going on and on to try and get me to say I was an apostate. Mm-hmm. And in the end, I I don't remember doing this, but I'm told that in the end I actually did throw my hands up and say, yes, I'm an apostate, disfellowship me, just to make it stop. Mm-hmm. I, I came away from that like a complete mental wreck, and it took me about three years to get back on my feet again. Yeah. I think after seven hours, most people would, you know. Yeah, just, no, it was, oh, and how it, do yeah. I extricate myself from well, the, this particular the, the, the situation that I found myself in? Well, I'll tell thing, them what they want to hear, yeah. you know. Yeah. Again, you don't you don't realize that you can do that at the time. Yeah. You're so indoctrinated to think that they've got complete power over you. It doesn't mm. even doesn't even cross your mind that you can just stand up and say screw you and walk out, you know. Mm. Mm. So you just sit there and you take the abuse, or I did. And then mm. a, a week later, because um, I appealed the decision, I said, I'm not an apostate. You know, I might have questions and doubts, but I still believe it's the truth, and I still believe in Jehovah, and I still believe the governing body of Jehovah's people. And um, a week later, I had an appeal hearing, and that went on for seven hours as well. So I had a total of 14 hours. And, uh, again, I was just complete wreck at the end of it um and they upheld it they upheld it on the basis that i'd been proud uh proud because i i didn't just accept what the governing body said so, wow mm. well the the um I, I forget the exact procedure now but when there's an appeal hearing um the the appeal committee can't just completely throw out the original that they have to um basically the original committee gets to to veto the appeal yeah. committee's decision and and yes. if there's any disagreement between the two it gets decided on by the branch yes so, well mm, that's interesting you say that because uh i do remember a tea break during the second hearing mm. uh during during the second during the appeal hearing it it felt like it was going my way and uh they started to understand me and I was like, great, this is good. Um, and we had a tea break and I heard some really loud voices, uh, really raised voices. And one of them was the, uh, that presiding overseer again. And it, it literally sounded like he was bullying the appeal committee into, mm. into submission. Yeah. And after wow. we'd had, you know, I'd had my Kit Kat and a cup of tea or whatever and went back in, the mood had completely changed and now it was totally against me again. Mm. <laughs> and it was like oh, it was it was awful really That's quite astonishing because mm. the you know i write about it in my book the the daniel's prophecy book was kind of like a, um a, a big landmark for me um I, I, it was the first time that i was reading uh material from the faithful slave that i mm. consciously disagreed with that, yeah. That, I, that i you know i was cognizant of the fact that it didn't make any sense and um, the only way that I could think of to kind of register my disagreement, because I was I was scared of even writing a question mark in the in the margin, was yeah. was to fold the page. I, I folded the page like into a triangle, and and I thought that's how I'm going to know that I disagree with this page because if anyone comes across my book and it's just folded pages and no one can say anything, yeah. um, but I remember confiding in. Uh, a guy that I was um, spending a lot of time preaching with, uh, you know, doing my pioneering with, and I told him all sorts of stuff um, mm. uh, about how how much I dis- disagreed with with the Daniel book and what my own theories were about Bible prophecy. I had some pretty crazy theories about Bible prophecy back then, and he went running to our presiding overseer, mm-hmm. um, who was actually a really lovely man. Um, and before I knew it, I was in this, in, in the, in the car with the presiding overseer. He, he arranged to work with me in, in the ministry. So there was no 
kind of rushing to a judicial committee. It was, Lloyd, I'd like to work with you on the on the ministry, you know. So he then made me go through all of my issues with the Daniel book in the car with him, the presiding overseer. And um, so I went through everything and, you know, I said, oh, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with this. And he just said, I have to ask you a question. Do you believe in 1914? And personally, at that point, I did. So I said, yeah, I believe in 1914. He said, well, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. <laughs> and that was, yeah. that was the end of the conversation. That's, that, that that's, that's all was, they care yeah, about. That's all they care about. Yeah. That, and and, that and now it makes sense because, yeah. of course, 1914 is integral to the entire structure of, of the, the theology. If you take Absolutely. away 1914, the whole house of cards collapses. So. Well, this is this is the problem I was having in that I I recognised 1914 didn't make any sense at all and it wasn't scriptural, and everything hinges off of that. So even the, you know, the 1919. I mean, at the time they didn't say that the governing body were the faithful and discreet slave. That that was added later, but you know, just just the idea that the um, the 1919 period was when Jesus chose the religion as his only true organization. You know, that wouldn't fit. That mm. wouldn't work. It's a well, house there isn't a single scripture no. in the Bible to support 1919. No. Yeah. So I, I found myself out on my, uh, out on my ear back then, mm. yeah. completely cut off from everybody. And, but you said uh, when, when I was kind of reading my notes, um, so it, it seems that in the, 20 years the final 20 years of your time as a witness you you were partaking so yeah. does does that mean that you got reinstated eventually and then you were partaking right. yeah yeah so i'd actually started partaking before i got disfellowshipped mm. about a year or two year or so before uh and then i was partaking all the way up to 2019 when i got disfellowshipped again um and i i carried on partaking for two memorials after i was disfellowshipped um right. but then eventually i just thought you know i don't believe this anymore mm. i don't believe it wow i still believe in i still believe in the whole um i still believe back in 2004 i had some kind of spiritual awakening that's kind of what i call it now but i don't so narrowly define it now as being um born again or anointed Mm. as a jehovah's witness i think back then i had some kind of spiritual awakening where i was waking up to uh my true kind of nature spiritually and mm. uh, i did what i guess i could only do as a jehovah's witness and i interpreted that as being anointed you know i didn't i didn't fit in with what i was being told i was which was you know surviving armageddon and living on earth forever you know, with pandas and large watermelons, and that never really did it for me. I always wanted something more spiritually, so I guess I naturally well, sort of hated towards a heavenly idea. You know, you, you were a bit you. You should have hung, hung around a bit because now they're offering smoothies and yachts. Smoothies so, and yachts. Oh right. Yeah. yeah, you can have your own yacht. <laughs> apparently. Um, yeah. Wow. So, well, I guess um, the question I have because you were so you were partaking right up until 2019 um so you would have been around and partaking in 2012 when of course i was uh the the entire um you know <laughs> the entire aura around the anointed um was kind of undermined by the governing mm -hmm. body saying actually we're the faithful and discreet slave um which which actually made sense because up to that point, they were referring to themselves as representatives of the, of the faithful and discreet right, slave. Yeah. And one of my biggest gripes when I was first waking up was, how can you call yourself a representative of a group of people that you're never consulting? You exactly. Know, th yeah, yeah. That's yeah, not exactly. what representative means. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I used to write into uh, Bethel with, hmm. uh, and, and even directly to the governing body sometimes with uh, ideas on sort of policy change or changes in doctrine that kind of thing and you just you just used to get like a stock answer back for the most part they weren't they weren't bothered in what any anointed people believed mm. and i actually i actually saw that coming anyway 
I saw that coming a mile off that the governing body would eventually say that only they were the slave. So when it happened, it was like, yeah, thought that was going to happen. Because I, I kind of started my activism <clears throat> before that. And, yep. um, you know, when I first started, my website was called JW Survey. And mm. one of the things that I thought would be really cool would be to have this survey where, you know, anyone who was involved with Jehovah's Witnesses could um, partake. Um, but I thought it would be really, really cool to have an opportunity for the anointed to actually say what they really think. So, you know, you're taking part in the survey and if you're one of the anointed, you just tick a box. And and I and we know then how many anointed have in, involved themselves in the survey and we're taking more of an active interest in what their opinions oh. are than the organisation that claims to represent them. Did you get any? Uh, did you get any? Yeah, we uh, did. We did get uh, people of uh, people who um, <clears throat> claim to be of the anointed uh, filling in the survey. It was a yeah. difficult one because... Um, the governing body are never questioned as to whether they're anointed or not. They say they're anointed and everyone goes, oh, yeah, they're anointed. But when you mm -hmm. when you partake of the emblems and declare that you are anointed, uh, it generally for, there's generally three types of people. There's the ones that think you're mentally insane. There's the ones that think you've gone apostate. Uh, and then there's the ones that are like, mm, well, we shouldn't question it. But there's very, very few that will say, oh, that's really great. Yeah, we support you in this. I think I, I probably had three people in all my time as a partaker that were supportive of me. The rest were, and it was really it was really easy as well to point the finger and say, oh, he's just mental, because I'd had some mental health issues in the past. And also that's in the literature. <clears throat> it's in the so literature. So they, they even said in, I think, 2017, exactly. you know, people might might partake because they're mentally unbalanced or something exactly hmm. or was it 2007 i'm getting my dates mixed up and then but, if you, um, you say yeah. oh no no i'm not i'm not mm. mental you know i'm quite stable mm. with my mental health at the moment um the next conclusion they jump to is oh well they must be they must be uh, apostate then there's something not right with them <laughs> yeah well now now that you've i've learned more about um you know your reasons for partaking and how all that began i'm now starting to wonder whether um you know what percentage of of those who do partake uh, every year because it's now like twenty thousand or, so, or so isn't it or, gone, you know, gone up go, a lot yeah going up every every year absolutely yeah <laughs> it's defying the the maths of of where we should be in terms of how many anointed there are um but anyway, uh, now that you've told me this, I'm I'm kind of wondering whether, you know, a percentage of those who who are who profess to be of the anointed uh, do so purely because scripturally, like you say, if you're a Christian, then I think that I think that is a I think that will be a large percentage actually. Mm. Myself, mm. I know at least three people that started partaking or planned to partake mm. because they didn't agree with. The doctrine, because all the memorial is really is is a ritualistic rejection of the absolutely. Ambulance. Yeah, yes. and I used to feel terrible about that. I used to go mm. to the memorial before I was partaking. I used to come home having not partaken, and I felt awful. I felt so bad, you know. And when I wow. did start partaking, it was actually a relief. It was like, oh yeah, I'm doing what a Christian should do, you know. Hmm. And and do you still identify as Christian? Mm, no, I don't think I do. Um, I would say I still I still respect the character of Jesus Christ, uh, the kind of person that he was, at least as he was portrayed in the Gospels. That kind of uh, kind, forgiving generally kind, forgiving sort of person, the golden rule, all that side of things. Mm. Um, but I tend to think Christianity as a whole is just another religion that's grown around a guy. Mm. You know, I don't, uh, I just think he was a Jewish rabbi, uh, yeah. spiritual master. Yeah. Okay. 
but I doubt a, I doubt a lot of the things that Jesus is said to have said or done anymore. Uh, and like I say, it's a, it's a bit like now I sort of see that whole spiritual awakening kind of thing in a much broader perspective. Now I don't I don't actually see religion as being at all helpful when it comes to spirituality. I think it's just a, a mechanism for controlling people, and spirituality is actually suppressed by any type of religion. I think you need to be free to explore and make your own decisions outside the framework of a set religion. So mm. no, I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a Christian, certainly not in that kind of traditional sort of framework anymore. But you identify as a spiritual person, which I take yeah. to mean that you, you feel a sense of awe, you feel a sense of perspective of your place in the cosmos. And yes. you, you know, do, do you, you know, believe in some kind of higher power or higher order to things? Yeah. So my, my, my view tends towards uh, pandeism, uh, which is the idea that the universe actually is God. Mm. If there is a God, this is it, the entire thing. Um, and also Advaitism, uh, which is a, a Hindu philosophy, uh, Advaita Vedanta, which again is the idea that the universe is a a manifestation of, if you want to call it God, they call it Brahman, which is the um, the kind of singularity of all po all potential, you know, the mm -hmm. supreme ultimate. Um, but I don't I don't actually believe in a an external or transcendent God anymore that's kind of sitting there judging everyone. Mm. I think if there is any if there is any sort of divine spark, we are it, you know, and we've got to make the we've got to make the best of it. We can't just rely on an external God doing everything for us. Wow. So, so I, don't, I don't worship anymore because I, I just figure if I worship, I'm just worshiping myself. Some people we're all do one. worship themselves. Oh, yeah, they probably do, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, this idea, I, I'm a big believer in oneness, mm. you know, that there is probably only one consciousness which exists and operates through all of us, that there's a divine spark in all of us and we should just be respectful of each other. And um, if there's any, if that's God, call it God. I don't tend to use the term God because that, kind of implies to me religiosity again mm. interesting it's clearly something that you've um you know devoted a lot of time and thought to mm. you know which you know takes me back to what i was saying at the beginning that you know your, your approach to activism is, is commendably kind of cerebral and you know you know you describe it on your on your blog as almost like a journey um oh, yeah. that, now's probably a good time to plug uh, onionunlimited.com which um which is the place to go to for your podcast uh, and you've written some books i have yeah am i allowed to plug it please well that's why i've just said it <laughs> i want I'm, you to plug your books that's what i'm doing at the minute so it's not yeah. released it's not released yet because my partner's in the process of uh, proofreading it and it's got to okay. page page 180 correcting all my typo errors uh, but yeah, it's like a 700, 600, 700 page book called Believing the Can Light. I just say, I think it's fantastic. I love that you're editing because I, I think that editing <laughs> is such a crucial part oh, of the, of the yeah, publishing yeah, yeah. process. And and what um, I, I'm, I'm still kind of mildly traumatized from the editing process for the reluctant apostate because it's like it would go through wave after wave after wave of proofreading and every single time we'd find problems. Every time you find a typo error. It's like, how, how did that stay hidden after like yeah. seven or eight read-throughs, you know? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, it's carry called, on. Uh, it's called Believing the Lie, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, I, I've coined that from that scripture in uh, Thessalonians, I think it is, where it says that God gave them up to believe the lie. Um, a story of cognitive dissonance, which is basically what my life has been. Uh, I've finally managed to find some peace, but my entire life I felt like I was uh, a square peg in a round hole. You know, I just didn't fit. And mentally, I think that's why I had a lot of mental health problems when I was in. We, we do need a degree of cognitive dissonance 
we, we, we all have it and we all need it. This is what I've, I learned when I, when I interviewed an expert on cognitive dissonance is that it's, it's a survival instinct. It's, it's it something is. that you helps need us to, to preserve able, our sense of self. If we don't have our sense of self, we're to basically. It though, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. You need to be able to resolve it. And if mm. you go like 20, 25 years, 50 years, whatever, with things gnawing at you. Yeah. And in the back of your mind, you think, if I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't believe this. Mm. But then it comes around to Thursday night and you've got to put your suit on and go down the Kingdom Hall and pretend again. And you do that week after week after week for year after year after year after year. Eventually, it's like you lose yourself. Mm. Can, can I just ask, what, what was... You know, you mentioned getting um, this fellowship in 2019. Mm. You know, 50 years is, is a long time to to stay in, and it sounds like you you were um, in the organisation for for 20 years after you started to uncover major flaws in in the theology. Um, yep. What what was the straw that broke the camel's back for you? What what straw finally pushed you out? The straw that broke the camel's back. So I got I got reinstated in 2009. Uh, on the basis that I would keep my mouth shut uh, and I did it for the sake of my family. So at the time I had a wife and, and four kids and I went for another 10 years just basically pretending that I believed it. Um, and my marriage wasn't particularly great. That that was, I think, the thing that finally broke the, broke the camel's back was... It was, um, I, I don't like kind of labeling people too much, but th there was a degree of, um, I would say, uh, mental and emotional abuse going on there. There was a lot of shouting at me and shouting at the kids, and I just never felt at peace in my own home. Um, and I couldn't resolve that. I tried so many different ways to resolve that, and it just it wouldn't work. And I think over 25 years, we just started growing apart. Me and my wife grew apart. I didn't really, I didn't love her anymore. And it turned out that she didn't love me either. Uh, we had a, a frank discussion after our marriage broke up and she actually admitted to me that she never loved me. She only married me because she did. She wanted to get away from her abusive father, who was a JW. We married young. You know, it's it's the same yeah. old story. Same old story. You think you're going to let get left on the shelf, so you you marry someone that on paper looks good. She was a pioneer. Uh, I was a pioneer. We got married, um, but there was just no intimacy there, no love. Uh, and I longed for that. And then I actually met somebody in the organisation, a sister who uh, I, I kind of fell head over heels for. Her. Um, and we tried to keep it friends, but it developed. Um, we never we never really did anything up to the point where it all came to the surface and my wife said to me, you've got feelings for that person, haven't you? And, um, you know, you, you reach that point eventually where you sort of got to admit it, haven't you? And you say, yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. You know, there is so something. you were basically in a, in a dysfunctional uh, it was, relationship yeah, yeah, and... Yeah. Do you, do you feel as though um, having t that dysfunctional relationship was was almost by default keeping you in the religion? Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I felt yeah. trapped. I think mm. on all levels, mm. I felt trapped, and the, the the I think it's because I had kids. Mm. I love my kids, and. Uh, you know, the idea of leaving my marriage didn't didn't like that idea because I'd be leaving my kids. The idea of leaving the organisation didn't like that idea because if I got disfellowshipped again, uh, my kids, they were all baptised. Um, the worry was that when they left home, they wouldn't have anything to do with me. So I was just kind of I've, I've likened it to trying to keep the uh, keep the wagon on the road when the when the wheels have fallen off the wagon mm. sort of thing, you know, Um it just wasn't going anywhere. And then ultimately push came to shove and I had to make a decision. And I chose to go with a person that I felt I loved and she loved me. And uh, 
that's what we decided to do. We were going to leave the organisation together, uh, disassociate. Um, I was going to leave my marriage. Um, I didn't at the time think that my children would cut me off. I thought that would still continue. Uh, but it didn't. It didn't. I ended up, uh, the, the person I left the organisation for actually ended up getting cold feet and going back. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. She, got, she got reproved. I got disfellowshipped. Uh, my wife divorced me, which was fair dues. You know, that's what I wanted. Mm. I wanted out of the marriage. Just something mm. I would say, I don't know if you've come across this, Lloyd. In the organisation, like, norm, normal people in everyday life, if they're in a marriage where they don't love each other, um, so many people will, will sit down with their partner and say, like, do you love me? No, I don't love you. Do I love you? No, I don't love you either. Um, is there anything we can do about this? No, not really. We've tried. Okay, well, let's part. You know, let's get, let's get divorced. You know, and you leave on amicable terms, let's say. In the organisation, that, for some reason, doesn't feel like an option. Hmm. So what well, you do... Well, it isn't an option. It's it's not an option, and you mm. and you you actually start to look for reasons for your marriage to break down. Mm. Um, I mean, I I know people in the organisation that have actually am, admitted to committing adultery in order to end their marriage, when they haven't they haven't committed adultery. They've just said so because they want to mm. end their marriage and have a scriptural reason to get a uh, divorce. Yeah. Mm. Um. And I think it's a that's very, a, very unhealthy, unhealthy state of affairs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have I frozen up on the camera or am I okay still? Oh, yes. And there appears to be some confetti. Oh, what's going on there? Uh, you, you seem to be throwing a wild party in, awesome. in there. <laughs> How about I dump you off and then try to bring, bring you back. back? Yeah, bring me yeah. back. That'd be great. Okay. Bear with us, viewers. Okay, hopefully the um, we'll get Daniel back shortly. And what we'll do is, um, as we wrap up, we'll... One, two, three. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can no longer see you. Well, you're just... Uh, let's have a look. Shall I just uh, stop my cam and start it again? Let's have a go. I think you might have to dump me and bring me... Okay, I'll dump you again. I mean, you've been dumped multiple times, Daniel. <laughs> but uh, we, we will what take... Is streaming? While you're... Uh, can you still hear me? I can still hear you, yeah. While you're just uh, dumping me and bringing me back, can I just... I'll tell you this. When I was an elder, I learned of an, a situation where um, there was a guy that wanted to be out of his marriage and... Uh, he went to the elders and he confessed that he'd committed pornea with his cat. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and obviously that was that's made up. Yeah, oh, but well, that, I don't know. I, I think so, yeah. But that's desperate, isn't it? Good that's grief. Desperate. I mean, don't write it off, you know. Um <laughs> sorry that's just put a really weird mental image in my head yeah hasn't it? That i wasn't expecting so, uh, so um I reached, I reached I, a point where my marriage broke down anyway was it. And, and and if you don't mind me asking um you know you've alluded to it already uh your uh children are shunning you is that right yes yeah yeah, yeah. they uh completely shunning me uh so i've, I've got no kids um and i lost my dad as well he he shuns me so and if if by any chance uh you, you know maybe curiosity will get the better of them maybe they'll see your you know your name on this live stream um and yep. you know they'll they'll click on it uh what would be your message to them um just i love them uh i think i might you might be able to get me back now. I think I've unfrozen. Hang on. Uh, I'm going to remove you and then add you. There work. we go. There we uh, go. Just I love my children, and I realise that I have uh, made mistakes in the past. I have. You know, I ended my marriage. Um, 
that wasn't a proud moment. Um, I was, I felt trapped. I didn't know what to do, you know, and just that I regret raising them as Jehovah's Witnesses when I knew for so many years that it wasn't the truth. I wish I'd been looking back now. I wish I'd been honest. I think that's it. I don't mm. regret that my marriage ended because it wasn't a good one, but I just regret that I wasn't honest, that I went about things in such a way that I kind of orchestrated an end to my marriage. Um, what I should have done is just sit down and say, this is what the situation is. You know, we're going to get divorced rather than, you know, all the pain and, because you know when you're when you're disfellowshipped and your marriage ends on sort of not very good terms that is quite traumatizing i think to kids isn't it mm. and i really regret that really regret that so i guess i'm sorry and i love you lots mm. and i wish you would leave jehovah's witnesses yeah well well let's hope they i i, th I think I think they will hear that message at some point. I mean, I hope so. Yeah. 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 And, and the door, uh, the door is always open. I think that as well. Sure. Yeah. Sure. At well, least, you know, at I, least the I, door for dialogue, you know, at least come and talk to me about it. Yeah. I, I feel for you. Um, you know, obviously I'm a father and, and that's, that's at least one thing I don't have to worry about. Um, in fact, mm. I, I even, I even joke with Jessica, um, about uh christmas and birthdays and it, it, it's the same joke but it always makes me chuckle and i'll say i'll say something like um you know what maybe we should become jehovah's witnesses again because you know what it's going to be cheaper because i don't have to get you christmas and birthday <laughs> presents and then she's like no <laughs> so it like, just gets this really big reaction um but being I, out of it being out yeah. of it is the best thing that ever happened to me it was yeah. a it was a painful exit Mm. The second time, particularly, I can uh, well imagine. And I had another mental breakdown over it. But three and a bit years on, uh, I've never been happier. Excellent. Mm. Well, you know what a way to end. And uh, before I do, uh, before we part ways, maybe we could go through some of the comments, which we can do because this, Ooh, you know, yes. this is a live stream. Um, Dano Capilano says, hi, Daniel and Lloyd Love from Canada. So we have Canadians uh, in our midst. Um, Loxana says, me too. I was interested in development, uh, but instead I wasted my time learning the Bible instead of Java. <laughs> I bought a book uh, entitled How to Learn Java in 21 Days. That was about 15 years back, and I still haven't completed it. <laughs> I mean, do they still have Java? Don't I know. thought... I thought Java was obsolete now, but maybe probably I'm wrong. is obsolete. Yeah. Um, Annie Oakley says seven hours is an interrogation, but even cops feed and water you. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and and uh, in oh. when you're being interrogated by the cops, you get to have your lawyer with you. <laughs> Whereas, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, but you will have had no personal representation no with personal you. Rep I was told I wasn't allowed any. I'll just quickly, I'll just tell you this. It's funny because I appealed it. I wasn't announced as disfellowshipped immediately as an apostate. Yeah. And the very next day I went on field ministry. I was, I was that determined. I wasn't going to be disfellowshipped for apostasy. That's bold. That's ministry, a bold yeah. move. Yeah. And uh, tea break time, I'm sat there next to one of the guys that the day before had tried to disfellowship me for apostasy. And we sat there eating Kit Kats and drinking tea as if, like, there's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is um, bold. Six, I'll six give it to later. you. Yeah, I know. You know, if you really yeah. believe I'm that bad, you know, you shouldn't be eating Kit Kats with me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we should, I should be getting some money from Kit Kats for the amount of times oh, it's yeah, been mentioned. Yeah. Th th this show has been brought to you by Kit Kats. By Kit Have Kat. a break. Oh, Have a Kit Kat. Um, SDR says being a JW is tortuous. It is. Um, Loxena says that's torture. Um, she also says, or, or he or she says, I didn't even go to my hearing. I was like, screw that. I need a nap. I think you got it right there. Um, uh, Pimoneer says disfellowshipped anointed. That's a new one. <laughs> oh, I've done everything, mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, Freddie Ray says, ah, so good to see Daniel. How's it going, mate? So it seems... It's going good. It's going really good, Freddie. Thank you. There, I'm sure there are many uh, watching this interview who uh, are very, very fond of you and are very appreciative of, of the work that you've you've contributed and Thank continue you. to Me contribute. Then. Uh, Linda Turner says, can you imagine how irked they would be for Daniel to be disfellowshipped and partaking? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I partook all the way through my disfellowshipping. I went to the Kingdom Hall and sat there partaking at the memorial for three and a bit years. Yeah. And, and they they know that they will have known that you were going to partake and they still had to give you the emblems. Yeah, uh, still you know. passed to me, yeah. What a mad ritual that is. It's... A, I, 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 it never uh, during that I, period. I, Sorry, go on. I'm talking because I was there. I was supposed to. Um, I was um, given the memorial talk one year, but it was. Uh, I ended up standing down just before I was supposed to give it, uh, so I started to do all the prep work, and you know it was only really when I started looking into like the outline and and what the whole process is that it really started to sink in how silly the whole thing was because oh yeah of course you know when you just attend the memorial you're not really watching everything that's going on but when you're giving the talk or you're really like heavily involved in it it's like you uh give the talk and the servers serve the emblems and then they come back and they sit in a row and then you come down to them and you serve them the emblems. And then you run along to the other end of the row so that they pass it back to you and then run what, up on the Why? <laughs> They've already <laughs> been literally carrying the stuff around the room, yeah. passing it to and from. Oh, it just doesn't make any sense. Anyway, yeah. don't get me started. Uh, <laughs> Grace and Justice says, I didn't fit either because the spirit in me was at loggerheads with the straitjacket thinking that destroys souls. Very that, well that said. Says it in a nutshell. That's exactly how I felt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, SDR says, "How can anyone stay sane as a Jehovah's Witness without cognitive dissonance?" Yep. And finally, Freddie Ray says, "When I was fully in, you could see there was two clear branches in the congregation society: the the organisationalists branch." And the Jesus mind branch, they are highly incompatible, but cognitive dissonance. And then I, I don't know what the rest means, but yeah. Uh, would you agree with that, Daniel? I would. Mm. Yeah, that's, I, I feel sorry for them because there are some really good people within the organization that really are spiritually minded and really do want to do things from a Christian perspective. And they're just they're shackled by all the cult side of things and following the governing body and being told what to believe and having to change their beliefs every two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, when they you know they just look at the Bible and even though I'm not a particularly a Bible believer anymore, when you read the Bible, you can see it's odds with what you've been told to do. So I feel sorry for those people because they don't have the freedom to actually live authentically. Indeed. And uh, Pancho Villamedia says this story is so compelling. It's It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show uh, and you. hear that story. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure it will be very, very relatable to many of my viewers. So please keep up the fantastic work. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, collaborate again at some point in the future. But for now, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me. Fabulous. Thank you for having me. That was a real privilege. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed today's live stream interview. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such content. But for now, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for watching.